you back. And can I urge those who are uh, up at the back of the hall? Be great. Why don't you come down so we can be a little cozier? Would that be okay? Just come on down and fill up the seats. Uh, that means that when we get to questions, it'll be easier to take questions from you. Come on, come on down and, and fill up your seats. Uh, I want to be uh, very brief because we have a superbly qualified chairman for this session, uh, Jonathan Cole. We have two trustees on this panel, so I have to be extremely well behaved because they're, they're here. And not just any trustee, but the chairman of the board of trustees of Central European University, who is currently um, described in your, on, your plat uh, on your program as just the president of Bard College, but he is the chairman of our board. And uh, uh, it, I would be remiss if I didn't thank him publicly for not just leadership recently, but leadership over a very long number of years at this university, and, and extend a similar uh, note of thanks to, to Jonathan Cole for his leadership and counsel. A very warm welcome to Helga Nowotny, who many of you will know has been a constant friend of uh, CU and serves as a uh, incredibly effective chairman of, a, of the Intellectual Themes Initiative at, at the university and is, um, uh, dispatches bad ideas with a clarity which is slightly terrifying but is deeply impressive. Uh, and finally, uh, Rogers Brubaker, again, who's been a friend of this university for 20 years, has taught here repeatedly at Nationalism Studies, is one of the reasons why Nationalism Studies has been so strong in our universities, very much because of Roger's commitment to visit here every year. Um, and, and finally, Allison Stanger. Allison and I have known each other for many years. Allison has been literally on the front lines of the battle for academic freedom. I'll leave her to tell the story, but I, I wanted to extend a particular personal welcome to you and thanks for um, being here. Uh, uh, it has been a challenge for you to be here and it's absolutely wonderful that you met the challenge and joined us today. And so I hand over to uh, Jonathan Cole. Thank you. We're going to try to uh, move through certainly the introductions very quickly. I'll be brief because these people I could spend uh, really any number of minutes on giving you their credentials and their background and we're pleased to have all of them here. I think it's quite a group, quite frankly. Uh, and I'm particularly happy that uh, again Professor uh, Stanger is with us from Middlebury. She's not going to be playing football for a while because she is suffering from a concussion and protocol will not allow her to do that. Um, as a result of, she may be one of the first literal physical casualties that we've had uh, in this, um, on, on this uh, symposia uh, involved in academic freedom. And then of course, we have um, a wonderful representation from the past anyway, from Columbia University. But Helga Novotny is of course, uh, extraordinarily distinguished and eminent uh, in uh, continental Europe for all that she has achieved. Uh, she did get her PhD at Columbia, but she's uh, published more than 300 articles. She's been the president of the European Research Council. Um, she's done, done just about everything that one can possibly do and receive the honors that she well deserves for her work um, from a variety of sources here and in the United States. And then there's Rogers Brubaker. I say he's the one who got away from Columbia. He was a, a student of um, Bob Merton's, uh, my mentor as well. And um, he eventually, uh, they sent him north for a while for some training in Harvard as a junior fellow, one of the most distinguished positions you can have in American academic life. And then he went out to the West Coast and we could never lure him back to uh, the East Coast. But thank God, goodness he's uh, been uh, with us at uh, CU for uh, many years. And then there's Leon Botstein, who um, almost needs no introduction here. He's chairman of the board, as Michael said, of CEU. He works um, with extraordinary energy 
uh, for this institution, but also is distinguished by the fact that I think he was perhaps the youngest um, president of a college and university in the United States at the age of 23, I think he took over board and has been there and has made Bard College one of the extraordinary places uh, in American higher education. One uh, place where I believe uh, you don't simply see uh, cookie cutter type students, you have an extraordinary uh, quirkiness and interest and in individuality. Uh, to their student body. A lot of this has to do with Leon's work. He's worked in prisons for uh, academic programs. He's worked to try to get rid of the last few years of high school in the United States, another terrific mission because it's nothing but um, stress and boredom, basically. And uh, I'm leaving out entirely the other uh, life in the way that he lives, which is as a, uh, as a conductor and a very, very fine one indeed who performs with a number of different orchestras, both in the United States and uh, in Europe. So I want to thank uh, each of you for being here, and we'll hear from you shortly uh, in the order that I introduce them. But I'll have a few uh, words uh, of my own, and they are really, in some sense, reinforcing uh, what we heard at the very beginning of the, uh, of, of the first uh, session. First of all, I want to stress one, one thing about academics, uh, academic freedom, which I have become increasingly interested in over, over the last 10 years, and that is the assertion that I'm willing to make, and I like to hear counterexamples or even existence proofs if you have them, that you cannot have a great university, a truly great university, without a deep commitment to the institutionalization and uh, the really uh, adherence to academic freedom and free inquiry. I have here a hierarchy of values, of core values of uh, universities, and you'll notice at the very bottom the two fundamental enabling values of academic freedom, free inquiry, and trust. We haven't talked about trust at all, but we could spend the whole session on it. But in academic freedom and free inquiry, I say it's enabling because without it, I don't believe you can have meritocracy, you can't have some of the other values which are in the hierarchy uh, itself. So it's at the very core of what we do and uh, the very core of our existence in creating and transmitting knowledge. I also want to note um, that, uh, you know, this is, the attacks on academic freedom are not new, certainly in the United States. I think that, um, the, from the very beginning of the turn of the century, we had the attacks on E.A. Ross. I think that was the economist you were referring to, uh, the famous Stanford case, who um, took on uh, Leland Stanford and, and uh, his, his widow and uh, was fired for it, basically. And uh, among other cases, led to the, uh, the birth of the AUP. And there were an enormous number of firings which were related to the World War I and the academic responses. Um, to the passage of the Alien and Sedition Acts. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over some of the uh, early uh, statements that were made by presidents of universities. Uh, Nicholas Murray Butler ran for vice president, actually, of the United States at one point. But basically saying there is not going to be um, <clears throat> any uh, tolerance of um, questioning of the, uh, the American entrance in the, uh, into the First World War. Um, and there were early uh, similar statements made by the president of Cornell and by the, uh, the president of Yale, who said there will be no witch hunts at Yale because there will be no witches. We do not intend to hire communists. So while they, when there have been scares, whether they be red scares or whether they be um, <coughs> University in, in some form of uh, under attack in some way, uh, academic freedom itself has been under attack in the United States. During the McCarthy period and the second uh, Red Scare, uh, we see people like Linus Pauling, who only won two Nobel Prizes, might have won the third for the discovery of the structure of the DNA molecule, how he, had he not been prevented uh, and harassed by the FBI and prevented from going to England, actually, to accept. Uh, membership in the Royal Society. Uh, this uh, delayed him and his work on the DNA molecule, and many people think he would have uh, discovered it before Watson and Crick. 
The great, great um, defender of academic freedom in my mind has always been Robert Hutchins at the University of Chicago. Um, and um, he has said on, on, he did say on occasion, along his 50 years, um, or, or close to 50 years of uh, leadership at the University of Chicago, uh, he said the danger to our institutions is not from the tiny minority who do not believe in them, it's from those who mistakenly repress the free spirit upon which those institutions are built. The policy of repression of ideas cannot work and has never worked. The alternative is the long, difficult road of education. And then probably the more important statement is the second statement, which really suggests that when you have apprehension and, and you scare professors because of threats to their um, ability to exercise academic freedom, uh, then you have the entire teaching profession intimidated and their refusal to uh, take on new uh, subjects and ideas and express them. Um, and all periods, whether they be the Vietnam War, aftermath of 9-11, of one can see attacks on um, aspects of free inquiry and even some of the aspects that we have today, for example, on uh, the politicization of uh, the CDC, the, uh, that is the Center for Disease Control, the way in which uh, the, uh, the <coughs> Congress has tried to uh, curtail peer, peer review, the ways in which Congress has tried to eliminate certain kinds of budget items like the study of political science that is not related to national defense issues. Uh, there are a host of examples in the post 9-11 era and right up to the current time where there are threats to eliminate the National Endowment for the Humanities, the National Endowment for the Arts, where academic freedom and ideas of free inquiry are in fact under attack. Now, I just want to say that today, um, for the first time, I believe, and I think this is a real turn, at least something for us to discuss, we are not finding that the attacks are necessarily coming from outside the university alone, but they are coming from inside the university and from an unlikely source, and that is the students themselves. The students have, by and large, been expansionists on free expression and for uh, tolerance of... Uh, of free inquiry, although they themselves protested during the Vietnam War about uh, war-related research and certainly wanted to get that off the campus, which they succeeded in doing. But now the students are beginning to question certain very basic aspects of uh, free inquiry, including the ideological basis for acceptable speak speakers, trigger warnings, safe spaces, microaggressions, things that had been mentioned earlier. Now, I'm going to set the bar very, very high because I'm going to say that I believe in the following, uh, the following basic principles, which I think are associated more with the University of Chicago than anywhere else in the United States. The first set come from the Calvin Committee report, in which uh, it basically says that a university faithful to its mission will provide enduring challenges to social values, policies, practices, and institutions. By design and by effect, it is the institution which creates discontent with the existing social arrangements and proposes new ones. In brief, a good university will be upsetting. And I'm not sure that our students, when they enter the university today, have any concept that that is one of the missions of the university, is actually to confront their biases, presuppositions, to challenge them, not necessarily to have them abandon those ideas, but at least to learn how to defend them. That is to say, the critical uh, thinking uh, that Joan talked about early this morning. And then, of course, part of the Calvin Committee report of 1967, which we're also in the middle of turbulence, uh, turbulent times, is the idea, first of all, that nobody, including the rector, the president, or the trustees, speaks for the university. The university is a community of individuals and the idea is fundamentally not to encroach upon the, or intimidate the views even of a, a very, very significant minority of the uh, community. Um, and then the neutrality of the university arises out of courage. Now, we do have Middlebury College. We're going to hear about speakers, um, and uh, Allison is going to tell us about that. We also have 
The Berkeley effect, as it were, I don't know how anyone navigates through Berkeley, but uh, may manage to. And then finally, I want to just end with uh, the follow-up in many ways, years and years later, to the Calvin Committee report, which is what I'll call the Stone Committee report. Jeffrey Stone was the chair of that committee. Um, and it lays out the role of free expression on campuses, which is closely linked to academic freedom. And it says it's not the proper role of the university to attempt to shield individuals from ideas and opinions they find unwelcome, disagreeable, or even deeply offensive. Although the university greatly values civility, and although all members of the university community share the responsibility for maintaining, maintaining the climate of mutual respect, concerns about civility and mutual respect can never be, rather than by, used as justification for closing off discussion of ideas, however offensive or disagreeable those ideas may be to some in the community. Now that's a position taken at the University of Chicago. That you may find people disagreeing with today, or you may be disagreeing with it today as well. John H. Mendy in this statement says pretty much the same thing, that he's deeply concerned with the kind of attacks on academic freedom and levels of intolerance from within the university. John was the outgoing provost at Stanford University. So this afternoon we're going to be considering these principles and discuss whether or not uh, you believe they go too far. Uh, and we'll begin then with Allison and follow on as the introductions were made. Well, good afternoon. Uh, it's a great pr privilege to have been invited to join you here today, and I can say that I've already learned a great deal, so thank you. Yesterday, I enjoyed landing at a Budapest airport named for Franz Liszt. Later this week, in fact, tomorrow, I will touch down at Prague's Václav Havel International Airport. I want to start by holding up these relatively new airport names, 2011 and 2012, respectively, as an occasion for some celebration. Could there be anything better for a lover of the arts and sciences? I visited Budapest previously for the first time in 1983. My first visit to Prague was in 1986. Both cities were then very different places. Though we seem to have returned to a dark hour in human history, I think it should give us all strength to remember that most of us gathered here have been fortunate witnesses to Central Europe's rebirth. The lands of Beethoven, Mozart, Freud, Kafka, Musil, Haydn, Curtis, and von Neumann clearly have unlimited future potential. Academic freedom is a foundation for both knowledge and human excellence. It matters what is happening in universities because as we've heard this morning, democracy and liberal education are intertwined. Others on this panel will no doubt speak eloquently to this connection. What I'm going to do is confine my brief remarks here today to what I've learned over the past few months through my own personal experience. So it won't be scientific. I will not provide data, but perhaps you might test some of my conjectures against your own experiences, and we can have a meaning meaningful conversation about what we value most. The fragility of things that Americans take for granted is something I only recently came to know. Important values I took to be self-evident truths are facing the gravest of challenges today within the ivory tower as well as beyond its confines. And that challenge, as the title of this con conference indicates, is global. Jonathan gave us a nice set of opening remarks that told you a little bit about uh, my own experiences. Let me just say, for those of you who don't know what happened to me this spring, uh, several of my students asked me to moderate a talk with the American Enterprise Institute scholar Charles Murray. For those of you who don't know, Charles Murray wrote a controversial book almost 25 years ago called The Bell Curve. That is what got students and faculty up 
in a, in, in a frenzy about him speaking on campus. He was actually coming to talk about a 2012 book called Coming Apart, which talked about the polarization in the United States uh, that pretty much foresaw the election of Donald Trump. But that wasn't significant to the protesters. They were stuck on what he had said uh, over two decades ago. Several of my students asked me to moderate a talk with Charles Murray. And I agreed without giving it much thought. My students know I am a Democrat, but the college courses I teach are obviously nonpartisan. As I wrote on Facebook immediately after the incident, I thought this was a chance to demonstrate publicly my commitment to the free and fair exchange of ideas. I'm a political scientist. I don't need to tell you that most of the academy is left-leaning. I think my entire department is comprised of Democrats, although there's one Republican that's sort of emerged through these recent events, I think. But so it's very important to us as political scientists to be sure we're entertaining the complete range of views, especially as they pertain to actual politics. So I thought this was a, a good opportunity uh, to demonstrate publicly my commitment to a free and fair exchange of views in my classroom. But as some of you may know, Dr. Murray was drowned out by students who never let him speak. We went to a remote location after that and kind of did a radio-free Middlebury version of the event with fire alarms going off, students banging on windows and hollering obscenities. You can see that video online if you're interested. Just bear in mind when you watch it that we were wearing directional microphones, which actually tones, dampens down the noise we were experiencing as we were trying to continue this conversation. But we did continue it. Then as, I was leaving, as we were leaving the building, uh, Dr. Murray and I were physically attacked while trying to leave campus. Basically, they were attacking him, intimidating him. He's 74 years old. I did what any decent human being would do. I grabbed his arm so he wouldn't fall. And then their hatred turned on me. So why did this happen in the United States of America, the land of the free? I thought about this a long time, and I think there are three reasons that I hold up for you here today. First, the election of Donald Trump set the stage for overreaction and misinterpretation. In that context, Charles Murray became a lightning rod that he would, might not otherwise have been. Second, in the run-up to the talk, some members of the Middlebury faculty cheered on the protests and did not encourage their students to read Charles Murray or listen to him first before drawing their own conclusions about his work or his character. And I can't stress to you enough how significant that was in, what, in the events that follows. Uh, we had some members of my own faculty standing up and admitting they had never read anything Charles Murray had written, but they could read the Southern Poverty Law Center website, and that told them everything they had to know. Third, some students believed that shutting down speech was a means to social justice. And some Middlebury professors shared that view thereby encouraging radical action. In the days that followed my injury, a campus consensus seemingly emerged that the goals of inclusivity and diversity on the one hand, and freedom of expression on the other hand, were in direct conflict. There was that you want someone, somehow one had to choose between one and the other. Middlebury's president, Lori Patton, thankfully challenged this view. And as she elaborated in a Wall Street Journal uh, opinion piece this month, Nothing could be further from the truth, since free expression in all sorts of ways that have already been articulated is the means to greater diversity, greater inclusivity. Yet the view that inclusivity and free speech are mutually exclusive has popular appeal. Why? Well, it seems to embrace moderation. It comforted those pain by the conflict they were witnessing, both on campus and beyond, because it meant that one didn't have to choose a side. There would be this middle position you could stake out. And that was, that was, in some sense, quite horrifying to me. There were, however, quite a few brave souls on our faculty who saw the foundation of the university under challenge and spoke up publicly, despite uh, pressures from majority opinion or this consensus opinion I just mentioned. mentioned. It's not a majority opinion. It's just, I think, what, what happens is you have a very vocal minority. It appears to be a more majority opi opinion. Decent people just stay on the sidelines to avoid conflict. 
But some faculty organized a Principles of Free Expression statement that was beautiful. Uh, it was published in the Wall Street Journal in March, and it gained over 100 signatures from the Middlebury faculty. I noticed three general patterns. Again, this is not scientific. I didn't count. But this is things I noticed I could count. But um, I'll just present these patterns to you here. These are patterns among the signatories. First, many supporters had studied or experienced intellectual life under an authoritarian or totalitarian regime. Um, I think that's, that, that explains their position in many ways. Second, another commonality that one might note is that many of the signatories had lived in red states, American red states, and had loved ones with whom they disagreed politically. And finally, quite a few of the signatories were older rather than younger. Now, I myself happen to fall into all three of these categories. <laughs> I should also add that professors from the sciences and mathematics and philosophy were disproportionately represented. So the sciences, I think, are a great untapped resources to mobilize the sciences in, in support of freedom of expression is something uh, I hope to do in the months ahead. In general, the signatories understood the critical importance of being able to agree to disagree, both for the sake of the community, free inquiry, and even democracy itself. It was shocking to discover that I had many colleagues who did not share my understanding of the Academy's and America's core values. So how can we explain this, this, this conflict within the American Academy? How is it possible for, possible for intellectuals in a free society to embrace censorship as an acceptable means? That's a long and complicated story that others have told and I perhaps will tell today. The short answer, in my instance, is that the proponents of shutting down speech or frightening off speakers don't see themselves as censors. They see themselves as upholding free speech by writing power inequities. So settling scores with someone like Charles Murray constitutes social justice. The best articulated version of this position comes from New York University's Vice Provost for Faculty, Arts, Humanities, and Diversity, Ulrich Bayer. In a recent New York Times opinion piece titled, What Snowflakes Get Right About Free Speech, Bayer de deplores the French post-structuralist philosopher Jean-Francois Lyotard in arguing, quote, that some topics, such as claims that some human beings are by definition inferior to others, or illegal or unworthy of legal standing, are not open to debate because such people cannot debate them on the same terms. Bayer and the advocates of censorship argue that free speech absolutists are the real censors, in that they challenge the rights of minorities to participate in public discourse. Bayer is therefore not, quote, overly worried that even the shrillest heckler's veto will end free speech in America. In other words, Charles Murray and I deserved to be shotted down. As I am still suffering from a heckler's veto concussion, I am perhaps not the best person to pronounce this line of reasoning specious. But I will note here that for those who have experienced life under communist or fascist dictatorship, it is an all too familiar argument. It is a position where ideology and groupthink call the shots, where harm to others other humans, is construed as collateral damage. As Václav Havel argued in his powerful 1978 essay, The Power of the Powerless, ideology, quote, offers human beings the illusion of an identity, of dignity, and of morality, while making it easier for them to part with them. After Trump's election, there's a dangerous idea taking hold on the American left today that we must somehow fight fire with fire. As a result, we now have in the United States an alt-left as well as an alt-right. The alt-left has embraced extremism 
in what they perceive as the only way to respond to alt-right extremism. In resisting Trumpism, they essentially advocate using Trump tactics. Democracy and reason debate have been and will be the main casualties since the extreme left and the extreme right are rebelling against liberalism itself. In this context, upholding freedom of expression protects all of us because it gives individuals ways to dissent without resorting to violence. Central Europeans should know better. A divided left is, is precisely what enabled the Nazi revolution. Retaliatory laws from both left and right that undermine freedom of expression, assembly, and speech must be denounced, both here and in the United States. Germany learned from its mistakes and got this balance right after a totalitarian past. Hungary must do the same. And in so doing, Americans will continue to have much to learn from Central Europe. Thank you. Classical definitions of academic freedom focused on freedom of research and teaching. In the American context, the right of professors to speak freely as citizens outside the university has also been emphasized. But many recent controversies over academic freedom in the U.S., and I limit my comments here to the U.S., have turned on speech inside the university, yet outside the traditional domains of research and teaching. Research and teaching, of course, continue to be central to the defense of academic freedom in the face of external pressures, notably from private and public funders, from government regulators, and from populist politicians. But this panel has been charged with addressing internal threats to academic freedom, and many recent internal controversies have not concerned the freedom of research or teaching. Many high-profile disputes have concerned invitations to controversial outside speakers, recent efforts to disinvite or deplatform such speakers have come from the left, as in the case that Allison has just described, or the cases of Milo Yiannopoulos and Ann Coulter at Berkeley, but also from the right, as in the number of cases involving pro-Palestinian speakers. But there's another kind of internal academic freedom controversy that I would like to focus on in my remarks. And this concerns the freedom to speak out about issues of campus governance. Consider three recent examples. In March 2015, students at Northwestern marched carrying mattresses and pillows to protest an article by Professor Laura Kipnis, an outspoken feminist cultural critic. The Chronicle of Higher Education article by Professor Kipnis had criticized new institutional rules regulating intimate relationships between faculty and students, and it also skewered what Kipnis, a gifted polemicist, called the mood of sexual paranoia on campus. Students petitioned the administration for an official condemnation of the article, and subsequently two students filed formal Title IX complaints against Kipnis on the basis of the article. This triggered a prolonged quasi-judicial official investigation that eventually exonerated Kipnis. Second case, later that year, Nicholas and Erica Christakis, the heads of one of Yale's residential colleges, were the targets of massive student protests calling for their dismissal. The trigger was an email Erica Christakis wrote, reflecting critically, but in a thoughtful, low-key way, on an earlier email that had been sent by Yale's Intercultural Affairs Council to all Yale students. This earlier email had called on students to avoid culturally unaware or insensitive choices in their Halloween costumes and provided some guidance for avoiding cultural appropriation and or misrepresentation. In response, Christakis acknowledged genuine concerns about cultural and personal representation, but worried about universities becoming quote, places of censure and prohibition, 
and also worried about the loss of confidence in students' capacities to regulate their own conduct without bureaucratic guidance from above. My last example concerns the protests that engulfed Evergreen State College in Washington last month. Here, too, the trigger was an email. This one circulated by biology professor Brett Weinstein. Weinstein's email criticized an official invitation to allies of people of color to absent themselves from campus for a so-called day of absence in order to attend a full day of workshops and other events addressing, and I quote, issues of race, equality, allyship, inclusion, and privilege from a majority culture or white perspective, end quote. While the same issues then would be addressed, uh, quote again, from the perspective of people of color in a full day of on-campus programming. Now this was a new twist on a long-standing evergreen tradition, originally inspired by a satirical 1965 play that depicted the chaos that results when the white residents of a southern town must cope with the sudden disappearance of the town's black residents. In previous years, students, faculty, and staff of color had been invited to attend off-campus programs discussing such issues, while allies had been invited to discuss the issues at on-campus workshops. Weinstein supported this tradition, but objected to the reversal of format, which he interpreted as a call for white students, faculty, and staff to absent themselves from campus. And Weinstein had earlier criticized a plan to require an equity justification or explanation for every faculty hire on the grounds that this would subordinate all other characteristics of applicants to one thing. Students demanded that Weinstein be fired. Police advised Weinstein that it wasn't safe for him to remain on campus. And 50 Evergreen faculty members signed a letter calling for formal disciplinary investigation against Weinstein after he went to the media to tell his side of the story. Now, these three controversies have several things in common. Unlike many other campus controversies, they originated not in a clash between right and left, or between liberals and conservatives, but in a clash between liberals and the identitarian left. Each controversy began with the articulation of liberal reservations about self-consciously progressive policies or practices pursued in the name of fostering inclusiveness and diversity on campus. And in each case, protesters did not seek to argue with the liberal critiques. They sought, instead, to stigmatize, to delegitimize, and to punish these critiques, treating them as outside the bounds of leg legitimate discussion. The calls for dismissal of the Christakis and Weinstein and the launching of a formal disciplinary investigation against Kipnis are, in my view, strong grounds for including in formulations of academic freedom an explicit and unambiguous defense of the freedom to speak out about issues of campus governance. Such speech, in my view, should not simply be constitutionally protected, but institutionally protected. That is, free from <laughs> threats of internal sanction. A vibrant notion of academic freedom should defend the legitimacy of such speech, not simply its legality. These controversies about campus governance reveal fundamental debates about the particular kind of institution the university is and should be. Should universities be defined as spaces of freewheeling debate, discussion, and even disagreement that may at times challenge you and even cause discomfort? This was the view taken by a much discussed University of Chicago letter to incoming students last August. Or should colleges and universities be defined as spaces of mutual respect and recognition where speech is and should be carefully practiced and regulated out of respect for the sensibilities of vulnerable groups so as to create a more truly inclusive and egalitarian learning environment? Now, the goal of creating a more inclusive and egalitarian learning environment is obviously a noble and important one. But pursuing this goal by policing speech and protecting feelings strikes me as misguided and dangerous for three reasons. First, the paternalistic, subjectivist, and therapeutic 
stance that informs this approach, a stance that treats students as fragile beings whose feelings must be protected, risks limiting and disabling those it is intended to serve. A one-sided focus on protecting and respecting feelings is arguably much more limiting uh, than cultivating and respecting capacities. Second, the paternalistic stance is embodied and expressed in an increasingly influential and institutionalized discourse built on the concept of cumulative and systematic microaggressions. This discourse redefines and inflates the notions of violence, trauma, assault, and safety, as well as bias and discrimination. It generates an ever-expanding catalog of harms caused by speech acts, and it cultivates and nurtures ever more exquisite forms of sensitivity to such harms. Most crucially, it makes feelings the ultimate arbiter of whether a harm has occurred. Third, the new campus paternalism makes everyone in the university community responsible for anticipating and therefore avoiding the possible harms that their speech might cause. Failure to avoid the harms caused by speech acts, however unintended those harms might be, may be the grounds for subjecting the speaker to disciplinary action. The proliferation of formal disciplinary investigations, often with minimal or inadequate procedural protections for the accused, has received considerable attention in the domain of sexual harassment, but investigatory bureaucracies have been expanding on campus in other domains as well. These tendencies point in an increasingly and disturbingly illiberal direction. They threaten to transform the university from a space of free and unencumbered exchange into a space of constrained, monitored, and inhibited exchange. They threaten to remake the university into a disciplinary institution in the Foucauldian sense, one that seeks to produce docile subjects who will speak in institutionally correct ways. They seek to produce docile subjects through an expanding array of training programs and through the proliferation and expansion of investigative and disciplinary bureaucracies, but docile subjects are produced most effectively through anticipatory self-censorship in a context in which harm has been redefined as subjective offense, in which everyone is obliged to anticipate the possible harms that their speech might cause to others, and in which that obligation is enforceable through formal and informal sanctions, in this context, self-policing and self-censorship become routine, and the exchange of ideas and opinions in research, in teaching, and in discussions about campus governance is restricted by the need to avoid any possibility of giving offense. And this cannot help but have a massive chilling effect on campus speech. What is to be done? This is a difficult question, especially in the present American context, where liberal visions of the university are threatened not only from within, but also, and indeed much more gravely, from without, by powerful forces including corporatization, privatization, conservative state and federal legislatures, and anti-intellectualist right-wing populism, including, as Joan Scott reminded us, unprecedented forms of bullying and threats on social media, not least from the alt-right. The question is complicated by the connection between the threat from within and the threat from without. Needless to say, events like the Evergreen and Yale protests or the Berkeley and Middlebury disturbances are red meat for Breitbart, Fox News, and conservative state legislatures. Conveniently, I've run out of time, so I will leave this question for discussion, except to say that as an unapologetic liberal myself, I do think liberals must become more visible and vocal in campus politics. I think we need to stand up and speak out on behalf of a liberal understanding of the university rather than simply grumble privately about the slow erosion and marginalization of that understanding. Thank you.
I will now speak as a European. And for a European listening to what we have heard, it is both amazing, it is worrying, immensely worrying, and it reminds us of the historical period that Europe lived through in the 30s and the terrible aftermath that followed and shook the continent. It raises question, and Alison has already pointed uh, to this, about the fragility of values. It's not only an American question. We have seen the rise of populism and nationalism everywhere in Europe. And for the moment, we have a period of respite and hope, but we don't know how long it will last. And it raises for all of us the terrifying question, can democracies die? I will focus on the universities I know best, the universities of continental Europe. The UK is a very special place and also this morning it became clear that uh, there is the Anglo-Saxon model, there is the continental model. The continental model very simply, it's largely public universities. It is largely state-funded universities, although private universities exist also. And for the um, most part, we don't have campuses and campus life and campus governance and everything that uh, goes with it. Now, I'm taking uh, Jonathan's question um, up. What makes a good university is it must be upsetting. So the question I want to raise here is, what is upsetting today in European universities, in continental European universities? Now just a very quick historical look backwards. I think there were two historical watersheds in the recent period for continental European universities. The first one was after the fall of communism, and we heard this morning what this meant for Hungary, but also other former uh, communist countries are struggling or were struggling with the way how to reconstruct their, their universities. The other event that happened mainly throughout Western Europe occurred around 68. It was a student revolt. It was very upsetting. It was accompanied with violence. Uh, but uh, it also was the end of a long historical period of the German type of Ordinarian University or the Mandarin University and the student revolt broke the monopoly of the, uh, this type of university everywhere where it still existed. But uh, looking at the wider society, what happened there, this was also the time when uh, in France we had Servan Schreiber uh, lamenting about Europe being left behind in terms of innovation in economic terms. You had in the US Harvey Brooks, who was advising the OECD, uh, coming up with a report that was urging uh, European political leaders to open up their universities, to have a larger group of their citizens studying at universities with the argument, if you want to get ahead economically, this is what you need to do. So I'm saying one thing happened inside the university, but we should also take a look at the wider societal con uh, context. And these were forces that were driving in the same direction, meaning what? It was indeed an opening of the university. Student numbers increased. It was an opening in the sense uh, that waves of so-called democratization happened within university. The governance structure was changed. You had uh, professors having um, their vote to be shared and their decision power to be shared with students, with representatives of the administration with uh, their younger colleagues and professors. Now, this kind of chaotic situation uh, could not last forever, as you can well imagine. 
And being state funded, there was always a kind of collusion or hidden interdependencies with the state and the ministries that were providing the funding. In terms of recruitment of professors, there were still ways to get around and uh, so on. But then um, it became clear, uh, and this coincided with the rise of neoliberalism in Western Europe, it became clear the democratization of this kind is not really compatible with the ideal of efficiency as preached by neoliberalism. And therefore, many countries, many universities in Europe started, and it started in the UK in fact, and it was brought to, to the continent in waves from the UK, the period started in which you had audits, you had evaluations of all kinds, you had universities having to sign very complex performance agreement with universities detailing what the university should be teaching, uh, how many students it should teach, etc., etc. You had all kinds of assessments, everything uh, we take for granted now that this is part of the governance of how a university should be run. But there is a downside and the downside is that for many European universities, the broad mission of taking in student numbers that was not matched by state funding continued. So you had rising student numbers, state funding did not increase uh, adequately, and so you had pressure building up inside the universities how to cope. You had the pressure coming from outside to perform according to KPIs and other assessment exercises. And um, if you look at the rankings, it's very obvious. Continental European universities, regardless of almost where you look, they all have a very bad student-staff uh, ratio, which pushes them down in the university rankings. So this is the situation, and what does it mean for the inside? Where is the effect on the inside, and what is upsetting in the inside? What is upsetting is that um, many faculty members, but especially the young researchers, the young upcoming generation of students, feel under tremendous pressure. The pressure has increased and there is the necessity for many university teachers, researchers to compete for outside funding or to get contract research regardless of where because means that come from the state are not sufficient. And this creates a climate that you also know in the US, but it is much more dense, I would say, in European universities to be felt. A climate that you have, uh, on the one hand, a certain precariousness with regard to careers. Many people are far too old until they find out, can we stay at the university, or is it better to move towards another career outside the university? And also in terms of getting funding, it's a much more diffuse situation where the funding comes from, how this can be integrated into a university sharpening its profile, be it in teaching, be it in research, because uh, the state uh, puts constraints. On the one hand, what you can do, what you can teach, uh, on the other hand, uh, the necessity to get outside funds. And what is most upsetting is, I would say, it's the loss of time. Time has become an extremely scarce resource and it's the loss of experimental spaces. Spaces where you can discuss and this is, after all, the ideal, Humboldt was mentioned this morning, but you don't have to go back to Humboldt's time, uh, in the most uh, members of my generation have experienced their student life 
as something where you had lots of time, you had lots of freedom to discuss, to take up topics, uh, whatever you wanted. All this is threatened to be lost and to be gone. And this is the threat that I see for most <coughs> continental universities coming from the inside. Now, one <coughs> respite that was given, with which I was fortunate to be associated with, was the establishment of the European Research Council, well known here at CEU, because you are one of the uh, <coughs> most successful beneficiaries uh, in, in this region which gives um, especially younger researchers the possibility for a period of five years to follow their ideas. But of course, this is not sufficient, having a success rate of 10%. Um, this cannot fill the, the need that has arisen otherwise. So what is to be done? And here I think, and perhaps this is also something to be discussed with uh, my American friends and colleagues, um, I think we have to take much more uh, seriously what is happening at the interface and the exchange and communication between science and society. And my feeling is that this is different in Europe from the US. And I think it's different in Europe partly because we still have the idea, the concept of Wissenschaft, and you find it in the Scandinavian language, you find it in German, where the social sciences and humanities are part of it. While in the Anglo-Saxon countries, you have science, and this means natural science, and then you have social sciences and the humanities. And this is another way of, um, of, of dividing the way how you look at uh, the world. And this um, idea of science being one whole Wissenschaft concept, I think makes it uh, perhaps easier to communicate with society and to find ways of communicating, bringing in somehow into the universities what happens in society. Um, and what I mean by that is, it started with the natural sciences. And I fully agree with Alison, and I want to encourage you, on the basis of my experience, the natural sciences had to start first. Because there was a loss of trust, started with the nuclear power controversy, followed by controversies about genetically modified organisms, that were big topics uh, that were discussed inside the universities and outside the universities. And the natural scientists had to say, well, we have to do something, we have to. They did it at first very naively, thinking it's enough if you inform uh, the public. Now they have learned the quick way that this is not the way to do it. And since then, there are various um, initiatives that come bottom up, partly they are also um, held through ministerial committees, etc to have more public engagement on the part of, um, uh, of university uh, researchers and researchers in other institutions. And this gives a window of opportunity to speak with society, to listen to what society has to say. And I think the social sciences are very late in doing this. The pressure was not so great, and um, there were perhaps um, it, Social scientists thought, well, we are in contact with society anyhow. We know what's going on there. But I think it's a different way whether you do research on people or whether you do research with uh, people. So um, <clears throat> I'm not trying to paint an ideal picture here of continental European universities. They are not a mirror of society, not even of the most talented members of society. We have done very badly in terms of diversity. If you look at uh, the number of uh, the younger generation, we call it with a migration background, uh, the second or third generation of migrants, 
the numbers that you find uh, at universities are very, very small, in no way keeping up with the way how ethnic diversity has also become part of the way how European societies function. I'm not speaking of the latest waves of migration and uh, asylum seekers. Nor has this opening in the, in the 70s of bringing in um, students from disadvantaged economic backgrounds really um, been fulfilled. So there's lots of work to be done. But I think um, looking at the many possible interfaces between science and society, we might be able to find a way forward. Thank you. I want to apologize first for the um, obvious amount of repetition that's going to come for, from whatever I have to say. I do want to preface my remarks by saying any analogy to the interwar period, um, particularly in the Evergreen State case, um, as you may know, there was a satirical novel published by Hugo Bettauer called Die Stadt ohne Juden, The City Without Jews. It was a, it was a paradistic uh, impression of Vienna uh, without Jews, which turned out to be a reality in 1945, and he actually described it very well. Uh, he got himself shot as well. Um, so this idea of imagining this play, which was the inspiration for this absence of a constituency on a campus, has a long history. I want to take this question uh, from the point of view of someone who's responsible for an institution in the United States, and is worried every day that this is going to happen on the campus. So I'm not, I'm no theorist of this is not my field. I'm an amateur, I'm only a veteran of trench warfare. Uh, so I have no particular systematic understanding of this. I'm actually an idiot on this subject. Uh, but I, I, I sense danger, and so I want to describe how that danger appears to me. Number one, let's take sympathetically the younger faculty and student attitude in the United States that in fact free speech is a conspiracy of powerful people, mostly white and older, to maintain their power. And the university is an instrument of that power. It's allied with big business and with government. That's what pays for most of the university, especially the research universities. And all this free speech is a hypocritical, moralistic lingo, which is designed to keep everything in place. Now, why would an intelligent, well-meaning young person believe such a thing in the United States of America? I can begin, I won't waste your time, by adducing them. The radical inequality of wealth and the absolute visibility of excessive, obscene wealth in the United States, the persistence of poverty and underemployment, and the persistence of racism in the North, in the South, which is visible to anyone for all the progress we can adduce, let alone, courtesy of our new elected president, a kind of blatant, uh, um, dismissive, attitude toward women, um, let alone all the uh, controversy that surrounds um, people of sexual difference and um, uh, sexual preference uh, uh, or an orientation. Um, so there is a kind of um, uh, dissonance between the rhetoric of free expression and free play of ideas and somehow the wrong ideas always win. Somehow nothing changes. There is no progress for all the rhetoric in their mind. So this is um, a level of anger which exists behind the alt-right. It also exists behind, I agree with Alison Sanger, this with the alt-left. And um, how do you deal with this? So their attitude to free speech comes to the second point. They also have absorbed somewhere out of the ether, which doesn't exist, the post-positivist um, critique 
epistemological critique of knowledge. You see, they believe there is no knowledge. It's all from the perspective of the viewer. If someone told them a fairy tale about the special theory of relativity, which wasn't what it was supposed to be, about everything is ultimately relative. It wasn't about the priority of frames of reference. It was somehow boulderized science between uh, Schrodinger's cat and uh, Heisenberg uncertainty and the theory, special theory of relativity. Somehow the word got out, courtesy of French <laughs> structural theorists, that somehow there is no truth. There's nothing objective. They don't actually believe that, although there is a growing portion, when it comes to being wheeled into an emergency room or getting on an airplane. No one gets on an airplane and says, this is a conspiracy. Now, it has to be a conspiracy that works. Uh, but I'm going to go to the alternative conspiracy that is a subjective, less loud, less noisy, less polluting mode of getting across the ocean. No one really tries it. If we opened up a booth and said, this doesn't operate by accepted laws of physics, but operates by our, a more desirable picture of the world, that may not be true. But the fact remains, that's why the scientists are very good allies, because they still believe in the rules of evidence, and they believe in the disprovability, and they believe in processes which actually can, and the rest of the people in social sciences or the humanities, there is, um, there is no legitimate basis for privileging one point of view over another. Now this absence of, um, of, of any confidence that there are rules of argument or rules of analysis, even in the use of speech. Certainly not issues of subjective analysis of quality, let's say in the arts or in literature, of beauty, of privileging high culture versus any other kind of form of culture. That um, therefore the claim, uh, absence these standards, uh, the claim to um, free speech is, is weakened because the marketplace of ideas, the idea that, that the, right, the right answer will be found, the truth will be found, uh, uh, no longer is an objective they actually uh, fully understand. The third is the privileging of subjectivity. My perspective is combined with the sense of, of loneliness which is uh, supplanted by membership in groups. <coughs> So the idea of the individual is subordinate to uh, my, my membership. So I am a member of um, a group. Uh, that group can be um, sexual orientation, it can be race, it can be religion. Um, and those groups are reductive in their definition, but they function on a campus socially. Going to a campus in the American University is a lonely experience. And uh, that's why they were fraternities and sororities. People don't function as individuals. They want to be liked by their peers. It's an unnatural situation, boxing in people between the ages of 17 and 21 and expecting civility. There were, never was civility on the American campus. There was violence on the campus in the 18th century, the 19th century. So this notion that somehow everybody is walking around as a kind of in incipient scholar uh, replacing speech uh, for violence is uh, is a little bit of a historical myth. Um, we're still more civilized than the Yale of the 1820s. Um, in any event, uh, the fact is that people are uncomfortable as individuals, so they identify with these groups. And these groups happen to be now the source of truth. Their perspective on the world is what seems to reign. That subjective experience, in my view, has been deepened in this generation by the echo chamber of the way modern technology is used and communication. There is no public space which they have experienced in which their ideas have been contested. They talk to each other and they form groups which are self-reinforcing. So you don't have the experience of having to defend a point of view against people in real time and real space. There's something cowardly about blogging, about putting notices on Facebook, it's cowardly. What I say to someone face to face requires a little bit more courage than writing. I have many colleagues who are very civilized in my presence and monstrous on email. <laughs> They're like the road rage. They're perfectly civilized, but they get behind the car and suddenly smoke comes out of their ears. And the thing about it is it's not erasable. 
I can always apologize to someone in a conversation, you misunderstood me, I actually didn't say that. But the email lives forever. And it allows disputes never to be actually ultimately settled. So this discourse of posting things, now you're done. You can't get rid of that post. You can apologize forever. The post remains. So there is a kind of huge memory reinforcer of differences, which makes compromise agreement very hard in this younger generation that actually doesn't use public space. You walk down any campus and it's amazing how few people are talking to one another, but they are texting or they're listening. So you have a kind of isolation that's compensated for this allegiance to a particular group. It's a kind of echo chamber. My fourth point is that there is a growing intolerance for deviancy. A university is a collection of deviants. I repeat, there is no person who has been hired by a university of any quality who is not deviant socially to be interested in classical languages, and to be interested in the fine points of Homeric diction, it makes you definitionally mad. <laughs> to be interested in quantum physics, to be able to understand the questions of modern physics, makes you an outlier. Yet the administrative pressures call for standardization, and the pressure for towing to an ideology cut against that natural deviance. Faculties are great as individuals because they are resistors of being pigeonholed. But the control of both what one says, the effort to control that, um, much less how one behaves, um, goes against um, the um, goes against what really the qualities of deviance are. You can't actually segment. You can't have an Albert Einstein or a Marie Curie and then have them be your average person. The deviance that may be cognitive is probably linked, we don't know enough, to other forms of deviance in behavior. Eccentricity, bizarre behavior. And those of us who administer the university understand part of our job is to protect from the rage of the outside the eccentric individual who has certain gifts. In my field, which is music, there are nothing but impossible eccentrics. Uh, and so it is, a, um, it is a problem now in the modern university that expects a kind of standardization of behavior as well as standardization of thought. And that finally leads to um, a, a, a tremendous problem of passivity. So uh, Alison Sanger's point that the, um, the the people who signed the defense of academic freedom are older, by and large, uh, means these are people with more of a historical memory um, of the period before the Second World War, or at least consciousness of those events, um, and also um, are uh, uh, probably um, more frightened of the consequences of a kind of intolerance. It's actually true that what we face is a kind of new version of what used to be um, a very um, doctrinaire, left-wing and fascist view of liberal conceits about free speech, debate, argument, and uh, arguments against the free press. There is a belief that there is a truth out there, and that truth is about uh, social justice, and that the barrier to that truth uh, are liberal inadequacy, uh, liberal conceits, um, and hypocrisy, and that freedom of speech and the life of the university and even research and the pursuit of scholarship are part of a complex of, um, of barriers uh, to realizing a real world of social justice. Um, I had to, uh, had to debate someone who believed that actually the whole enterprise of the university is actually a mirror image of an oppressive society which is designed to prevent those who are disadvantaged from reaching status of dignity and equality. So your view that there is a conflict between the ideologies of free expression and research and learning and that of social justice is actually true. And this is not new because it was also within 
early Soviet and late communist theory as well. Um, now, what's to be done about it? I, I, I have to say that um, my own view is that one has to have a sympathetic ear to why the younger generation, both of faculty and students, don't see what we see. We need to break out of our own echo chamber of being quite clear that free expression, the kind of thing that Jonathan put forward, are absolutely uh, not to be questioned. I happen to believe in them deeply, uh, and um, uh, but having an Eastern European background and being an immigrant, and uh, um, it, it seems second nature to me. I think the scientists are of enormous value, enormous value, and underutilized value in the leadership of universities uh, in defending this. But I think one has to hear very carefully that cloaked in this craziness, which the American University is now engaged in, is a severe reaction to a lot of undelivered claims in the American space. And those undelivered, they date back to the election of Ronald Reagan, and there are claims about economic opportunity, about social justice, about actually confronting racism. So we're taking down statues of Confederate generals, but we're not actually erecting memorials to all the people who were lynched and killed in the period after the Civil War. There is a kind of huge, um, which Trump represents, um, a hypocritical attitude. Um, there is um, the questions of medical care, education, and social services in the United States is a catastrophic situation. And uh, so there is, um, the university is viewed in some way as, um, as papering over uh, or defending. And we have to find a way to separate what we do and the, the idea of freedom of speech and of academic freedom uh, from uh, an alliance, a tacit alliance uh, with those causes. And also to defend the importance of language. One of the most terrifying things about the American campus now is the intent uh, to identify what you mean by the words you use without any differentiation of the command of language. Han Arendt had the thought that real thinking was the moment you actually, like Bakhtin, you actually found a way to use words differently and that therefore you couldn't identify sort of a reductive ideology by the use of certain vocabulary. That's the most noxious thing, that a, a person on a university campus can be called to task uh, for the use of vocabulary uh, without any understanding of what that context of the meaning is or the intent, or let alone humor or irony. The capacity of that is completely gone. There is no way um, to make any kind of joke at anyone's expense, even yourself. Um, and uh, so this is something has to be fought, but to fight it, um, there has to be more than a, a generational moralizing. Uh, we're in a situation that reminds me of the late 60s when the radicals of the 30s couldn't understand why the radicals of the 60s wouldn't listen to them. Well, they, all they did was moralize. We were there, we had, you don't, and this is not going to work, definitely not going to work. Um, and to understand sympathetically why young people with a good heart and with the potential have been so unbelievably bamboozled by, by what is clearly nonsensical. Uh, and there's a way around it and takes a lot of patience. Uh, I'm quite optimistic, um, but I think the university has to be self-critical about the extent to which it, um, it finds a way to defend what we need to defend uh, in a way that allies us, makes us allies, with some real um, commitment uh, to address the issues which uh, seem to have fallen off uh, the agenda, uh, even for the liberals since the Clinton era, which is why, in some sense, um, I actually think the election of Trump is a moment of uh, a dialectical optimism. Uh, it has a put I think, an end. I think you're finished now. Yes, all right. <laughs> put an end to a certain kind of uh, complacency. Thanks. Thank you. We, um...
we are typically running a little bit behind schedule, but uh, I wanted to have a couple of uh, questions from the audience if they wish to, uh, to have questions of any of our panelists. Yes, Joe. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I guess my, my question maybe follows from what Leon Botstein has just said about a, a self-critical notion of how to think about all of these problems. And, and it seems to me that there's a political question that we haven't addressed. And that is that um, one, it comes in part from what I kept hearing in some of the other talks about uh, a, a collapsing all student protesters into the alt-left. Um, most of the student protesters violating free speech rights are not of the alt-left. Um, but the alt, the right, not necessarily the alt-right, the right is now engaged in a campaign in which freedom of speech is their mantra. There's a, the Goldwater Institute has proposed a student bill of rights uh, which would introduce neutrality into the classroom, which would do all sorts of things that none of us, I think, would think of as commensurate with the kind of education we're interested in. Uh, and, and what they're doing in many cases is provoking, via the Young Republicans on campus, via the uh, Young Americans for Freedom, uh, whose, who, who, whose organizations are paid for by the Koch brothers and the Bradley Foundation and others, uh, and are sending people like Yiannopoulos and Ann Coulter deliberately to provoke what they know will be the response that you've been describing on the part of some students on the left. So I guess my question is, one, what kind of critique can we make of this behavior of the students we are disapproving of that doesn't play into <coughs> the hands of these right-wing groups that are determined to label all of them the alt-left <laughs> and, and the, the uh, totalitarian mind control people who, will, who are the, the problem of the university, the old tenured radicals of Dinesh D'Souza's days. How do we offer our criticism without playing into the hands of this right-wing, I don't want to say conspiracy, but I almost want to, to, to dis discredit not only these students, who some of whose protests, I think, Leon, your, your notion that these kids are, are disappointed at uh, legitimate issues without a way to express them, without a, the, the appropriate political forum to express them. Just one other small, small point, which is that in the analysis that's been offered of where this behavior is coming from, the neoliberal university and its definition of students as paying climate, uh, clients who need to be made comfortable, who don't need to be challenged, and, and who shouldn't be made uncomfortable in the, in the way you talked about it, Jonathan, that neoliberal university has in part given them the language, the only language they have, to make the demands they want to make. So those are, those are my two uh, questions. Yeah, questions. let me go very quickly say that one thing I would say that one way to counteract it is that we have a problem with our faculty that are now, in my view, too narrowly trained intellectually to join in a general conversation. This is a real problem. PhDs coming out in various fields who are unable to converse with the political theory and philosophy that's behind what we do. So very quickly, because I, I want to take too much time, number one, uh, um, Brother Brube mentioned this letter from the University of Chicago. A good example, that letter made a, a cardinal mistake. Mm -hmm. In defending a certain set of virtues, it didn't acknowledge that, it didn't acknowledge the empathy and sympathy which at this age group, these the young kids, we have safe spaces. What was the Hillel House at the University of Chicago? I was uh, maybe the lone Jew. I needed a, they thought I needed a, I, I didn't like Jews, but no, I, I did you know, I wanted to, but what, what was the Newman Societies for Protestant institutions that brought Catholic students? That was a safe space. Trigger warning. So when I took a course in Russian literature, somebody told me, don't be aware you come along a lot of anti-Semites in this thing. And, a lot, and if I took anti-Semitism out of Russian literature, there'd be nothing left to read, <laughs> right? But the professor was smart enough to say, 
In case you don't know, around the corner, a bunch of anti-Semites. No, I'm happy, thank you for telling me. Now we call that a trigger warning. Don't overrate. The right wing has to be pushed back on because they are essentially, um, they, are ca they are caricaturizing, you're right, the, the protest. I, I just want to add one more thing, Kate. I, I know you have a question. I'll be very, very quick. I believe it's a, that, that many of the leaders of our universities are guilty of not explaining what a university is about when our students or faculty come to them. They don't know anything about the house that but they're about to live that's in. That's because some of them are corporate clients. So that, 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 that may well be true, but they have to be disabused of this, or they have to be described, they have to be told that there are safe spaces, etc., etc., before they're seniors and are about to leave. So we have failed uh, our, ourselves by an absence of adequate leadership of putting this on the agenda at the very first moment. We just make them feel happy they got in, basically. That's the problem. Anyway, Katie. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you. Some of you may have noticed I've been bouncing up and down with a certain agitation uh, because there's a couple of facts I'd like to bring to us. One is, in the American campus, one reason why the story has to be told that Leon has just described is because so many of our students are the first in their family to go to college. And they approach college or university with some trepidation and some anxiety, and often with a lot of economic and social fears. So the story has to be told of what the values are of this space to students who are very brave and making this great social journey into this space called college and university and making it because we have told them they're not going to earn a living unless they do. I also, Leon, this is without irony, which will surprise you. I subscribe to much of what Leon says, especially in his conclusion. So thank you, Leon. But I do have to say something. I'm a faculty member of NYU. I want to say something about NYU. It is true, Allison, that we have an associate provost who wrote an article in defense of snowflakes that perhaps, he's a good friend of mine, perhaps the argument might have been stronger. But it is equally important to know that the provost of NYU wrote immediately to the New York Times and said he was expressing his academic freedom as an individual faculty member, and that all readers of the New York Times should know that academic freedom was a bedrock principle of New York University <laughs> and of every great American university. So we're not quite the schlocky place you may have thought. <laughs> uh, any one of them, or a couple more, we have maybe two more questions, and I think we have to really call it. Uh, we're going to have any coffee break at all, so uh, <laughs> right back in red and red, red shirt. Thank you. I I wonder where to draw the line and how. So if if a speaker on the campus is not just saying some racist or sexist comments or earlier in a newspaper or something, but let's say give a whole talk about that Hitler was the best and really promote it, would you, would you restrict that? And if you would restrict that, would you do so because you think that the content is just beyond any acceptable limit, if there is such a thing? Or you would restrict it only because and if it creates imminent danger of violence because some people in the audience may get so angry that attack the speaker or something like that. So what would be your justification for restricting such an extreme form of, of really hateful stuff? You're, uh, you're talking about drawing the lines, I think basically line drawing about this? Yeah. Well, um, Allison can speak to it, but I would just simply say this. I, I think that the, um, the line for me would be almost non-existent, and I think many universities hide behind the imminent danger argument. And if they are anticipatory 
at all and know what's going on, they can control um, the, uh, the extent to which danger actually uh, would exist. Now, the ideas may be stupid, they may be ignorant, they may be offensive to people, and those have to be met by counter-arguments. And, and, and the students and faculty must participate in that counter, uh, counter set of arguments. That's part of why they're there, not to be protected. Yeah, let me, let me say that uh, what Jonathan Cole says is, uh, in our situation, my view is that free speech on campus has something different from free speech on the street. If I speak on the street, I just get up on a soapbox and say what I think. In a university, you cannot simply say something and walk away. You must actually be subjected to criticism. So if you have flat earth theory, speak, you speak the flat earth, then some physicist has to be able to get up and say, well, what about this and this and this? So actually those arguments can be, can be contested. If you adhere to those rules, then in fact there are very few uh, limits and the safety issue, I think, is sometimes used um, uh, 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 poorly. Uh, so I think um, the worse the ideas, the, 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 the better, especially if the forum is to expose them through criticism and debate. Two Just two points really telegraphically. First, I think Joan is right that we need to distinguish between the alt-left and the protesters. In the case of Charles Murray, protests, there's just a small minority that wanted to shut down speech. Some were protesting outside, some were only going to stand up and not shot down the speaker. There were all sorts of different approaches to protests that were legitimate. It was the shutdown crowd that was the problem and the student leading that shutdown crowd invited in an anti-fascist group from Burlington who was part of the crowd that roughed us up. Uh, sec second point is that Charles Murray is, is not Milo Yiannopoulos. All right? He was invited by students, was not faculty originated, and then the political science department in, in gave a co-sponsorship. What then transpired was that another department, sociology, anthropology, more or less encouraged students to censor the political science department. So I think we need a treaty of Westphalia for departments. Uh, I'm gonna allow, I wanna thank everybody here. We can have outside conversations over coffee. I want uh, Rogers to have the final word, and then we will uh, break for 10 minutes. Just two quick uh, remarks on, on the boundary drawing question. I think it's important to distinguish the question of what's legally permissible, given the specific American tradition of uh, free speech uh, jurisprudence, from the question of what's institutionally acceptable speech. And the kinds of issues that I was discussing about mm -hmm. issues about internal campus governance, nobody argues that these are legally unprotected. Everyone agrees they're legally. The question is, are they legitimate in a university context? And the second quick point, just I completely agree with what John Scott was saying about the danger of playing into the hands uh, of the right. However, I think it is also important to remember that without any critique, the students who engage in certain kinds of protests are themselves already playing into the hands yeah. of the right. It that didn't take any critique of the events at Middlebury for the footage to be on television. It didn't take any critique of the events at Berkeley for the footage to be all over Fox News. It didn't take any critique of the screaming to Christakis at Yale, the screaming to Weinstein at Evergreen for these to be all over social media. You know, they're, they're all, the playing into the hands of the right is already there, and one thing liberals should do is try to talk to students about how that happens and show them that they themselves are playing into the hands of the right, the alt-right, etc. Thank you to our panelists and thank you everybody. We're going to break now for 10 minutes. Uh, you've heard what you need to hear, but can I uh, tell you that we're now widening out, having had this riveting discussion to academic freedom and the state. We will be talking about Turkey. We will be talking about Bangladesh. We will be talking about Abu Dhabi. Suddenly, we're going global, folks, in 10 minutes, so make, make that coffee break quick, please. <laughs>